Yeah, I Fair agree, I agree that they haven't done the hard work. I mean, this is see one of the things we're what we're actually really asking for is for the FCC to do such a proceeding. All right. I mean, we, we're not look. The FCC can't turn on a dime tomorrow and reclassify. All right. They can't do that. Um, but we're saying, look, you can't you can't have this national broadband plan of 500 pages and not say we have to make sure we have the authority to do this. Okay, so we're not asking them within the national broadband plan. To, to decide the reclassification slash authority question. That would be really poor agency uh, decision making. But what we're saying is, you know, soon thereafter, you've got to tee it up. Because if the Comcast case comes out uh, and with a decision on authority as opposed to procedure, you've got a national broadband plan that's worthless. Okay, so, so at some point, you're going to have to do that hard work, whether it's reclassifying or finding the ancillary authority and doing the hard work. Can I just answer the, the FTC? So, so the, the FTC's mandate is, is narrow, okay? It goes after unfair and deceptive trade practices, all right? Now, if Comcast is blocking my bits, that's not necessarily an unfair and deceptive trade practice. Okay? And there is a difference, and it may not also rise to uh, an antitrust violation. So, because somebody the other day, I was in San Francisco giving a speech, and she said, well, why can't you bring a complaint to the Justice Department? Number one, individuals, you know, just can't bring complaints. But, you know, what Comcast was doing, I actually, I, dis I really disagreed with uh, the Martin FCC's decision saying that, that Comcast was blocking BitTorrent as a competitive matter. I, I wasn't convinced of that at all. And I'm not sure, you know, that they were trying to favor their video um, a service, and that's why they blocked Bit, uh, BitTorrent. So. I'm not so sure that would have arisen to a level where the antitrust authorities or the FTC could take care of it. The FCC does have public interest authority, and it's a little bit broader. So, Gigi, isn't one perverse outcome of the return to Title II that you'd put broadband services back uh, under the common carrier exemption and take the FTC cops sort of off the beat for yes, these issues? Yes, that, that is perverse. And I, and I think the common carrier exemption should be, take, uh, uh, should and, be revealed. And, and do you think the FTC? <laughs> I mean, Just try to be consistent. <laughs> And, and the FTC obviously has your responsibility for the rest of the economy. Do you just feel like it's not adequate for this portion of the economy? I mean, you seem to suggest that their un, unfair and deceptive practices test is not sufficient to protect That's correct. the public, mm -hmm. and you just think the public is generally not well protected. And no, not 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 without not without some clearer uh, uh, authority for the FCC to to, to uh, take care of it. Um, I'm Ern Reynolds, and I have a. Uh, six sentence argument that I'd like to present to Helgi and anybody on the panel. <laughs> First, uh, we at Federalist Society respect what endures and is sound. Second, regulation that survives and endures is more principle based than rule based. Third, policy statements are what I take to be principle based. Fourth, statutes and regulations are what I take to be rule based. Five, Rules get nibbled away by loopholes and judicial rulings. Number six is the question. Should we do more to make policy statements enforceable? The way to make a policy statement enforceable is to follow the procedural requirements of the Administrative Procedure Act for turning a policy statement, which is essentially an aspirational document, into something that has the force and effect of law. Policy statements have a very useful uh, function when they are providing guidance on an existing legal duty, which can be embodied in any number of ways, a rule, an agency precedent, or even a federal statute. They're helpful because they give regulated entities some guidance and some clarity on what's expected of them. But a policy statement standing alone is not enforceable, and the APA requires that agencies follow a certain procedure, notice and comment, before they can be treated as law. It's a pretty simple proposition. Um, and we hope the D.C. Circuit agrees. <laughs> Additional questions, yeah. Thank you. D Gigi mentioned the broadband plan, which I believe is the commission's response to a statutory obligation from about a year ago. So my question goes to the commission and its underlying statutory authority. What part of the statutes of the United States allow the commission to say, we're coming to Congress to ask for the following law. It would seem to me that it would be the Congress that says, we tell you where to work or what to work on, and you may tell us whether you have authority to do such and such, but you shouldn't be asking. 
I would think that chairman up on the hill would be very uh, nervous about this type of activity. Someone in the room can check me on this, but I believe the National Broadband Plan mandate included requests for statutory changes. I, I think most chairmen have read the obligations of the commission is to respond to Congress if they're asked for legislative suggestions, but not to gratuitously go and sort of suggest things and lobby them. I don't know if anyone has a different well, view. No, I, th I think it's normal for agencies, if they don't feel that they have the ability to do something, to ask Congress to give them the ability or to give somebody else the ability. A lot of what the National Broadband Plan, my understanding, is going to be about is how broadband promotes things like, you know, uh, energy savings and health care and education. So, you know, this massive process that's been going on for the last six to eight months has involved, like, the departments of energy and education uh, and health and human services. So it may not, the FCC may not just be asking Congress um, to give it, it the ability to do things. It may be asking it to give other agencies the ability. I, I'm fairly certain there's a copyright question in there where they're going to make recommendations for changing copyright law actually in a way that I like, even though I'm generally uncomfortable with the FCC making recommendations with copyright, even if it's in a way I like. If the FCC were part of the executive branch that uh, were uh, responsive to the President, then the necessary and expedient clause of Article II of the Constitution would certainly authorize it to recommend measures to Congress. Uh, since they occupy a, you know, a, uh, a, a netherland, uh, kind of presumptively independent of the, uh, of the President, uh, I'm not sure whether they can invoke that provision in Article II, but it's certainly uh, normal that they, that they would recommend measures to Congress. Another question or two before we wrap up? Oh, we have a statement called, Whose Ox is Being Gored? And um, I've heard the libraries, but I don't know if they were in that context of, of this. I've heard Comcast. Um, so uh, is this a, I'm assuming this is a, um, a dollars issue. It's not a cultural war issue or anything like that. But So who are you representing? Well, I'm not sure it's so much, it, it is a dollars issue to some extent, to the extent, I, I think, and I don't want to speak for the carriers, they're here in the room, is, is a lot of the carriers see the oodles and oodles and oodles of money that Google makes and they want part of it. All right? So in that way, it is a, a, a dollars and cents issue. But a lot of it is a, it's a control issue. All right? cable, you know, cable is used to controlling you know, all the channels on its system and deciding what position they get with the exception of broadcast stations, of course. Uh, and whether they get on the digital tier and, and so on and so forth. So it's, it's kind of a, you know, being used to what you know. And there's a huge advantage if you're a carrier to actually have control. Carriers don't like to seed control, just like content, content uh, uh, providers don't like to seed control. So I think some of it is just, a, you know, this has been our business model forever. Um, and also seeing, you know, seeing the edge providers making all this money, I think carriers want a piece of the pie. You know, you're using my pipes. We can argue whether they're really your pipes or not. So why aren't you paying me? I mean, I think Gigi's right that internet access providers who invest and put tremendous amounts of capital into building these networks, which I do believe they own, um, <laughs> would like to retain control of that. Would you like it if the government told you that they wanted to park somebody else's car in your garage? Well, I don't think so. So it's not just about dollars. Um, and it's also about and we are here, you know, at a federal society panel, it's about the, the proper limits of administrative law and what agencies can do when they go off and sanction a private company for violating something that literally was not law. So there is a higher principle here, and it's whether agencies can go out and regulate important sectors of the American economy when, in a democratic system, Congress has not apparently given them any authority to do that. So I think that is an important legal principle that's at stake here. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not here representing anyone. I'm come at it from more from the academic perspective that Helgi just mentioned. I mean, I do think that from the internet service provider's perspective, um, they're trying to provide the best services possible, the most efficient services, the services that people want. And to the extent that they feel that federal regulation, however well-intentioned, is preventing them from doing that, they're concerned about it. And I think they would be particularly concerned to be put into a completely <coughs> different box that, that would subject them to much more regulation. Now, since Gigi's been outnumbered, I'll let her go last on our closing question here. Um, outnumbered, but not outmanned. <laughs> <laughs> um, indeed. What's the, what's the biggest threat to the future of the internet, Greg? 
boy. <laughs> it's a nice small question. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, you know, the one thing that I guess I can say is that it's worked pretty well up to this point. I mean, I, you know, I, I can't think of a few more explosive phenomenons during our lifetime. So, uh, you know, it, 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 as an invention, it's worked pretty well. So I'm not sure that we should necessarily be looking for a fix to anything. I think it's, you know, unnecessary government regulation that stifles the investment and the tremendous innovation that we've, that we've seen since the origins of the Internet. And Title II reclassification would be a step backwards in, in that regard. So I think that the biggest threat to the future of the Internet is that this fantastic democratic medium, this user-controlled, decentralized, innovation without permission network that distinguish itself from all the top-down, you know, command and control broadcasting and cable casting will be replaced with a top-down centralized system that has, you know, limited access to innovators, limited access to creators. I think that's the, the greatest threat, is that regardless of whose ox is being gored, the Internet was built to be, built to be user controlled, to allow anyone to speak, not to be controlled by the providers of the on-ramp. And if we don't preserve that, then the internet will, will cease to be the internet that we know and love, and which has really changed the world in so many ways. Great. With those final words, a round of applause for our great panel. Thank you all. <laughs>